Well, I'd like to welcome everybody today. We've done, I'm Mike Twitty. I'm your Pinellas County property appraiser. Um, have a couple other staff members in the room. Um, our deputy of assessment administration is here with us today. So he may jump in some at the end with some Q and A. And John Van Heest, who is our community communications manager. He will be manning the AV controls from the back side of the room. Um, other things, housekeeping, issues for those that are here um, in person and thank you all for being here today um, if you need restrooms they're back around that way towards the the doors you came through there's water back that way we've got coffee and cookies here so all you out in virtual land you're missing the coffees and cookie cookies and um, I do hope you guys can find your, your own restrooms I don't think I need to give you directions to those so um, we're gonna get started we're gonna cover a lot of stuff I'm going to ask that if you if you can um, throw your questions in chat or jot them down and we'll get them at the end just so we can get through a lot of topics because we're trying to cram a lot into about an hour window and, and then we'll have plenty of as much time as you want for Q&A at the end. So um, we're going to go through a lot of stuff. Um, just as a quick survey in the room, how many how many new homeowners do we have in Florida? Okay that bought and I'm assuming either 2020 or 2021. Okay, great. That's what we were hoping for. And, but anybody that's, that's on, that's been a long time homeowner or um, is maybe looking for a home, I encourage you to stay on. All this information is really relevant to anyone that owns property in Pinellas County or anywhere in Florida. Um, it's not just first timers. Um, there's a lot of good stuff that a lot of people that have been here their whole life don't realize. So, I promise there'll be some good takeaways or else we'll give you your money back. Um, so we're going to try and demystify what goes on with some of Florida property tax laws. They are quite, um, can be quite um, mystifying, but you've moved to a very beautiful place. Uh, Pinellas County is in, in my mind, All right, we're trying to come back on. Let's go. Why did it drop it? And we're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, not sure what happened. But anyway, so Pinellas County is unlike any other county in the state. We're a peninsula on a peninsula. So it's really a great microcosm of what Florida is as a whole in, in a very condensed form. These are just a few, few aerial shots around our county. That's obviously downtown St. Pete before the pier, the new pier was finished. You can see it was under construction at that time. That's the whole Beach Drive area down to the airport. This is out by the Don Cesar on St. Pete Beach, looking back across the Bayway. You can see downtown St. Pete off there in the distance on the left. So a um, couple of quick Florida facts. Um, if Florida were a country, it would actually rank 17th in gross domestic product, which is pretty impressive um, when, you, when you look at that on a, on, a, on a big scale. Disney World is obviously um, a, a very large employer and they're the largest at a single location within Florida with over 70,000 employees. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that two third of two thirds of Florida, our lands are still used in agricultural. Um, so around the rim where everybody, most people live, you know, closer to the water and then up the whole rest of the center of the state, a lot of agricultural uh, is going on. And our biggest export is actually meat, not citrus. So, a lot of people don't realize how much how much cattle ranching um, goes on in Florida. And then our biggest export is actually civilian airplanes and aircraft parts. Um, Tampa City Clearwater MSA is 25th in GDP and 18th in population throughout the US. And then our largest river, just, just an interesting fact, actually flows from south to north. That's the St. John's River. 
goes up towards the Jacksonville area. So again, welcome to Pinellas County. I know some, you know, we are the densest county in the entire state. We're the second smallest in land mass physically. We're only about 38 miles long and vary from, you know, 15 to 20 miles wide. Got a lot of people packed in here. It's about 3,500 people per square mile. Um, so more than double the set number two county, which is Broward. Got a lot of coastline. If you start counting all our little fingers and um, all of that, it's almost 600 miles of coastline within a very physically small county, 280 square miles of land mass. And what a lot of people don't realize is we have a lot of manufacturing in, in, in our county. Our employee base for manufacturing is actually number one in Tampa Bay and number two statewide. And a lot of that goes back to those manufacturing of, of aircraft and aircraft parts. So you all, a lot of you probably came from other states. Um, and if you did, you may have called your property appraiser an assessor, or they may have even had, they may have been an auditor. Some people, those constitutional offices may have done a, a myriad of duties. Um, they might've been your assessor and a collector. Um, so it's, it's different all across, all across the country, but in Florida, we have five constitutional officers that are elected by the public that serve and are seated in their respective counties. We have 67 counties. And so you've got your property appraiser, your sheriff, your tax collector, your clerk, and your supervisor. Um, they all perform very specialized duties. And um, like I said, the property appraiser and the tax collector are not one and the same. I get confused for this guy called the tax collector a lot, as you can see. He's got, he looks far more evil with that goatee. I made sure to shave mine off a long time ago. Um, so our duties are, are very different. We're located in the same building. We've actually have four locations um, around Pinellas County to serve the public. Our main operation is in downtown Clearwater in the courthouse building. That's where we have basically all disciplines in that office. Um, tax collector is distributed all around. We only co-locate with the tax collector here and in our mid-county office. Everywhere else, we stand independent from them. So just to make sure you're aware, and the, the duties of the tax collector, you know, they obviously, they're distributing the tax bills, they're, they're actually collecting the dollars. So you'll never have to write a check to the property appraiser's office, they all go to the tax collector's office. Um, but they also manage the Department of Motor Vehicles for the state of Florida that duty was handed off to them years ago. It used to be a freestanding agency and now the, the tax collectors handle that through throughout Florida. And you can also get um, fishing licenses and those types of things through them as well and concealed weapons and, um, and obviously pay your tax bills and they have um, different way, methods of payment. In Florida, there is a discount for property tax payments. It starts, you know, you get your bill in early November, if you pay in November, then you get a 4% discount. And then that discount decreases by 1% for each month until that 4% goes away. So when you get to March, you're paying the gross bill amount. And if you go into April, now you're delinquent. So um, any, of, any of you all that are carrying a mortgage, then you're paying into an escrow account, those those lenders that manage the escrow accounts, they always pay in November to make sure you get the discount. So what happens at the property appraiser's office? So we are charged with valuing every parcel within the county as of January 1 of each year. That's our effective date of value. Doesn't mean we actually can value all 450,000 parcels on that day. So we have to do it over time, but, but we're looking at data that is focused on an effective date of value as of that point in time. So we generally are collecting, for example, when we, when we hung values for this year for 2021, for January 1, we were using data from 2020. So we're always behind, which benefits the property owner in a rising market. So, cause we're always behind the values a little bit. Um, the other thing we do is we administer all of the property tax exemptions. So homestead is obviously the biggie. And then um, you have many disability and senior exemptions, those types of things. So
So we, we um, handle that process. And then a lot of people don't realize, we, but we all the GIS mapping that you see for the tax maps on our website, we manage that for all the and manage all the ownership changes. So we get the deed, the deeds from the clerk for all the transactions. Then we scrub those further, vet those, process those ownership changes. A lot of the title companies, you know, lean on us for that that chain of title. We're not the official chain of title, um, so there are a lot of times deeds are not prepared quite correctly. A witness, they're missing a witness. Um, something is is off in the tenancy um, that creates us to kind of kick back letters out to the to the property owners to to alert them that they might need to go back to their title company or get with an attorney to make sure they get their their chain of title correct. And then obviously we um, we handle lots of um, customer service requests and we have to certify the role each year and that goes up to the Department of Revenue. So they're essentially, um, they, they are the ones that approve our budget. Our budget is not approved by the County Commission. We stand independent of that as a constitutional office so that there isn't a conflict of interest there. So that keeps us separate from taxing authorities everything gets vetted through the Department of Revenue. So taxing authorities here in Pinellas County, we have a lot of them, almost 60. I think we're up to 56 or 57 at this point. I, we have a slide in here, I think it says 56, but I think we got a new one this year um, that just came on. So that number may have changed slightly, but um, obviously in, in, in Florida, most of, because we don't have a state income tax, so most of the things paid for locally are, gener are generated by property taxes. So all your services are driven by that. So there's that taxing authority slide. There's just kind of a sampling that we pointed out before. We have 24 different municipalities in a, in a fairly small area. And obviously their role is to arrive at a budget amount. They kind of back in, they use our taxable value number taxable value times millage rate equals tax dollars. So they look at the budget they need, they look at our taxable value roll number and determine what their millage rate should be. Can you explain that more depth later? Sure. And some of this that's coming up may help clarify that a little bit. So this is just to give you kind of the property tax timeline is as we said that january one date is critical for us that's that effective date um, of value for us march one is your homestead deadline so any of you that have not yet filed for homestead but did own an, or will own and occupy before january one of this coming year make sure you get your homestead applications in we can take them from you today if you're in this room um, and then April 1 is big for uh, tangible personal property filings, but that's a more for your, our business property owners. That's for you know equipment, essentially. And then uh, June 1 is when we deliver our first values. Those are estimates that we give to the taxing authority so they can start their budget planning process. Then we certify those values in, in, at the beginning of July. Those get pushed up to DOR and then also to the taxing authorities. They continue to... Um, to work through budget hearings in August. We deliver the trim notices, which I suspect you all got around this a little after this date in August. Taxing authorities continue to hold budget hearings. That's when they uh, finalize their millage rates as you move into October. Then we extend the role to the tax collector they may mail the bills right around Halloween. And then as we talked about November, you can start to pay and get the 4% discount. And the deadline is March 31st. So how are property taxes determined? So in our office, there are three main values. When you look at a trim notice, and we'll show one a little bit later on, but they're Understanding the terminology is important because when you hear about value out in the marketplace on the street, you're just thinking about market value. You know, what are things selling for? Well, in our world, it's a little bit different. So our just or market value is 
the closest number to that street market value. But it's still, again, we're behind. We're usually, you know, we could be as much as a year and a half behind with data um, that's relative to that January 1 date. But that's the value that we end up placing on the property. You'll see that on the website. You'll see that in your trim notice. And then assessed value is the next value that's important. And that is the value that ends up over time being capped with the Save Our Homes cap. So any of you all that acquired property um, in the last year or two, when you cross that first January 1 under your new ownership, that is when your cap resets. So any homestead that the prior property owner had or any other exemptions, whether they were totally and permanently disabled, um, you know, anything else that was on there, those all go away when you cross. You get the benefit of them for the rest of that year that you bought, but then when you cross January 1, those all, that slate wipes clean, that assessed value resets to market. So then, so that first year after you start off with those two numbers are the same. And then over time in a rising market, that just value number can continue to go up and it may be going up at a greater clip than the consumer price index or 3%, which is the cap for the Save Our Homes. And I will we'll get into that in a little more detail. But that's what starts to create that divergence between those two numbers. And then taxable value, that is the actual number that is multiplied against the millage rate to determine taxes. And the difference between assessed value and taxable is a function of whatever exemptions are on the property. Yes, we're gonna we're gonna go right into it. So again, value times rate equals taxes. So that's taxable value is always the number where you <coughs> and that's ad valorem taxes. So you have ad valorems and you have non ad valorems. Ad valorems that's Latin for according to value. So that's based on the value. The non ads are not according to value. They're just flat rates that are typically applied. So if you're in a certain fire district, they may have just a flat ad valorem. You know, one hundred twenty five dollars a year that they stack on. Um, you'll see stormwater sewer in if you're in unincorporated county. They'll have, uh, I'm sorry, not sewer, stormwater. Um, that'll be a separate charge. But there's just a quick example. So 20 mils is roughly equivalent. You move the decimal place three to the left. So it's equivalent to 2%. And one mil is equivalent to $1 for every $1,000 of taxable value. Special assessments, like we said, that's a non-ad, so that's a flat rate generally. Might be for undergrounding utilities, different things that occur in different neighborhoods. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so, and we're gonna get into all the Save Our Homes cap and how that works. It's just it's a couple, couple slides down. So, but everything starts with us determining market value. So again, that January 1 date, there are three um, approaches to value in the appraisal profession. So you have sales comparison cost and the income approach. On houses, it's generally driven by your sales comparison and your cost approaches. Those are the ones that are relevant. Income approach is more for income producing properties where the highest and best use is income generation. So a hotel, uh, shopping center, you know, that's where your income approach is your main driver. So that's part of our job is to determine what the appropriate approaches to value are that that drive the value. It's really about what, how would a buyer look at it? So your logical buyers are what method of value are they used? So that has a lot to do with how we end up approaching our valuations. And then we're doing mass appraisal as opposed to what's known as fee appraisal. So, you know, if somebody's coming into for a lender that's appraising your home, you know, they're pulling four comparable sales and doing direct sales comparison. They might sketch out a really rough basic cost approach, but they're really leaning on the sales comparison approach. Uh, when we do it, we might have hundreds of sales in our model. We're using statistical modeling because we have to value so many properties around the same effective data value. So we can't do it quite the same way. And then if you ever have questions about your value, please reach out to us. We're, we're always available uh, via phone, email, 
um, we can set meetings on Teams and do virtual type calls with you. If you want to see people face to face, you can come in. We have breakout rooms where we can meet. But we always encourage people when our values go to the website in July, the early values, if you see something wrong or think, you know, we might have missed something, uh, just call us and come in, have an informal meeting with us. Really, the best time to do that is in July, uh, really July and early August, because you want to do it before the trim notices come out. And then if you can't. If you still think we're off, um, you still have an issue, you always have the right to file a petition at the Value Adjustment Board. That's through the clerk's office. That is separate from us. We have no, we are a participant. Obviously, we have to show up. Um, that's a, go, you go before a special magistrate that is hired by the clerk's office and the, and the Value Adjustment Board. It really is actually who hires them. But um, they have legal magistrates for anything exemption related, and then they have appraisal magistrates for anything that's valuation related. So you would bring your evidence and we would bring ours in and the magistrate would, would determine. So we, we kind of addressed some of this at the beginning, um, but I'm just curious. So in the room right now, how many of you have all bought in 2020? Okay, and did you guys already, already file for Homestead? Yeah, I got it. Okay, good. Not yet? Well, but in 2020, you bought? Okay, but you could have filed for 21. Did you file for 2021? Okay, all right. Well, before you leave today, we may wanna take you to the, the front counter here and get you started, get your application so you'll, you'll be on for 22. Or you can unmute yourself. Yes, hi. I'm just wondering, can you tell me what for the current tax year? I assume we're in fiscal 22 right now. Yes. Well, we're and every all the bills that are out are for 21 right now. Okay. And what period does that tax bill cover? Is it a calendar year or do you have a different fiscal year? No, it's a, it's a calendar year. The, the county budget runs on a fiscal year that starts October 1, but that's totally different than the way the billing cycle works. It's a calendar year for us. So, for... so the bill we get in November will be for January through December of 2021. Correct. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then do we have anybody here? Uh, obviously, the rest of the room is prob probably purchased in 2021. So if you haven't filed yet, you can file right away. Um, you have up until March of next year. But I would recommend getting those applications in as soon as you can. And you can do it online um, as long as you've been in in your spot long enough that your driver's license is changed and you know those types of things that you meet all the criteria if if you have some things like your driver's license that haven't um, been converted over yet to florida then you can still go to um to any of our offices and we can we can help get the process started yes It, it depends on what other forms of identification he might have. So you have a passport, then he wouldn't need a Florida ID, I don't think. Would he, Kevin? Um, so there's no car, no license in Florida? Right. Uh, easily get a Florida ID through the tax collector, and that, that, would, that would take the place of a license. We would prefer that you have one. That, is, that, that gives us an uh, indication that you are officially a Florida resident. Okay, so now we're jumping into Homestead. So, quick history of Homestead. Started all the way back in 1934 in Florida. It was only $5,000, but $5,000 based on property values back then was actually 
pretty large exemption. It might have been the whole value of a lot of, a lot of properties. So it doubled in the 60s. It went to 25,000 in 1980. We call that the first 25 because when it went to 50, it became two 25s and they're calculated a little different just because Florida likes to be compl complicated. And um, in the 90s, the Save Our Homes Amendment was passed. Um, that was largely due to the Lee County property appraiser who, who um, championed that. And then in 2008, a second 25,000 of homestead exemption was added to raise the total to 50. That's also when portability kicked in and we put a 10% cap on assessed value increases for all other property. So if you're not homesteaded, you fall under the 10% cap. Doesn't matter what the property type is, whether it's commercial or residential or vacant land, doesn't matter of whatever the assessed value was in the prior year. So the way that that, um, is that automatic, is that automatic or is that yeah, there's no application for that. No, it automatically go up 10% every year. No. No, it, it goes whatever market is, but it can't exceed 10% in a given year. So if, if market moved 15%, then it's going to hit the 10% cap. If if it only moved five, it's only going to move five. So the way the um, the two bands of twenty five thousand break down to get your full fifty thousand. Oh, this is the one. Oh yeah. So the first twenty five full exemption applies to all millages. The second twenty five um, applies to all millages except schools. So it's a little bit different. And how it is applied and it gets tricky if you have a, not that many properties fall in this mix because almost all properties break seventy five thousand dollars these days but you'd be surprised how many uh, residents that have been in especially some senior condos for a long period of time their assessed values are still under that seventy five thousand dollar mark so they're still not getting the full benefit of that second band of twenty five thousand you can see how this how this jumps you get full exemption here then it skips 25,000 of value with no exemptions and then the second 25 kicks in applied to 50 to 75,000 of assessed value so that gets a little complicated i know I understand correctly if you buy a home for a hundred thousand dollars you get a fifty thousand dollar exemption so you only tax on fifty thousand the remaining Probably, yes Second 25, we'll still have school taxes. School tax millages are still in there. So homestead exemption, people always wonder what it what it's actually worth in dollars. Well, it depends on where you live within the county. As we said, there's 24 different municipalities, a lot of different taxing districts. So whatever your millage rate shakes out to, you could it could be a savings of generally 800, well, with first and second combined, I guess it, depending on the jurisdiction, it can be as low as 500 and up to a thousand dollars, just depending on what your millage rates are. Um, but then when you add in the save our homes cap over time, that's where the really big savings come in because that can far exceed your $50,000 general homestead exemption. And the save our homes cap, the way that works is it kicks in after it starts Effectively, you know, that first January one after your own, after your um, under your ownership, the cap resets, and then the cap start the homestead cap starts to protect you in those years moving forward. So, in your second year of ownership, whatever we put your assessed value at when you crossed your first January one, that next year, your assessed value ha cannot have moved more than three percent or the consumer price index, whichever is lower. And that 3% um, has rarely been hit since the beginning of the Save Our Homes cap. Just to show you, well, that's the criteria. It's not, okay. I've got a slide where it shows the history of CPI. We're not quite there yet. Yes, John. I do have a question online. Uh, Alexander is wondering what the current mill rate is in Ellis. Depends on where you are. Um, on average, it's about 20 mils. 
some are high, some are a little higher, some are lower. It's generally about 16 mils to about 23 mils, just depending on where you are. Un unincorpor unincorporated is around 20. Um, so let's run over these criteria real quick. So in order to do, to qualify for a homestead, to apply for homestead exempt, you have to own and occupy by January one, be a permanent Florida resident. It's based on one homestead, uh, per person or marital unit. And then you can have no other residency based exemptions in another state or obviously in our state either. And then, um, corporate entities are not entitled. For homestead and just be wary of that if you put your homestead in place and you talk to an attorney and they say oh for limited liability protection you should put your home into an llc we advise against that it's going to reset your cap it's a different form of ownership and you're going to lose any cap benefit as a result of that so save our homes we've already touched on that it's basically um the difference between that assessed value and that just market value over time, that differential is your benefit, your Save Our Homes benefit. We also call it the differential. Um, as we said, it can't go up more than 3% per year. This is the history of the CPI over the last 11 years. And you can see it's in the last 11 years, it only hit 3% one time. I've got a little bad news because of inflationary factors and things that we've had going on for 2022, it's going to hit 3%, but you can see it's been, you know, last year was really low. There were, there was a time during the early part of last year where CPI was actually negative, um, during the pandemic, during the, the, you know, the early months of it between, you know, March and July. Um, but it bounced back some. But you can see it's been down as low as you know 0.7 percent so that's a pretty big um protection amount this next year it, it likely could be cpi could be in the five to six range um, but you'll still be capped at three yes barbara online has a question barbara you can unmute yourself hi um yes you were talking about the ownership entities uh homesteading if the property is in a trust, can you still homestead? Yes, but the trust okay. has to provide equitable and beneficial title to the to the um, trustee. So it just has to have the appropriate language in the trust and not all of them are prepared correctly. So we, we would advise you to reach out to our in-house counsel. Just contact our office at our main number and say you'd like to run some trust language by our our in-house counsel, and he would be happy to review it and let you know if it's if it's appropriate. Thank you. Sure. So we're jumping back into Save Our Homes just to give you a couple of examples to show, kind of let you um, see how it actually works. So in this example here, um, you can see the cap reset under the new ownership. So both the just market and the assessed value are both at $300,000. There's no save our homes benefit. The next year, the market rose 5%. The assessed value was capped at the 3%. And we're using the full 3% in this example, which the bottom line there in that first year resulted in save our homes benefit of $6,000. So that's 6,000 less taxable dollars that you are paying taxes against. The millage rate is not applying to those six thousand um, dollars when you start to take that over time you can see that it creates this differential here and that save our homes benefit begins to rise and then when you factor in your fifty thousand dollar exemption because that comes after assessed value just market assessed less exemptions equals taxable so then you get down to your taxable numbers. Those against this example is against 20 mils. You can see its effect on the actual tax bill there. And then here in this example, 
It's sold in year seven. New owner comes in. They're revalued at five hundred thousand, and that first year they get. Well, after they they reset, they get they've applied for homestead. They get their fifty thousand, but they don't have any differential to work with, so they're up to nine thousand dollars. And the process carries on. So this question comes up a lot, especially when um, out of town buyers come in. Um, and they buy and they start poking around on our website or the tax collector site and they notice that the home next to them is basically a carbon copy of theirs and they see that they've got a tax bill that's substantially lower than theirs. And the reason is because of that Saver Homes gap. They might have been there for the last 20 years and been protected by that for a long period of time. And that's what creates these anomalies. That seems just. We didn't make the law, we just have to follow it. So who makes the law? The legislators. Local. State legislature. Um, they pass those laws. Governor has to approve them. Um, some go to the some go to the ballot. You know, most of the ones related to taxation, if they're related to taxation, all of these went to the ballot and were constitutional amendments that had to be approved. So they were approved by the voters. Crazy market the way it is now. Mm -hmm. If someone were to be stupid crazy and sell their house for two bucks, that figured into the... No, we did, we disqualify that sale. Yeah. Go up, but it would not ever come down. No. Well, it can come down too. So I'm going to show not, you... Not like it can go up. Yeah. Oh, yes, it can. Oh, it can come it down. Will. Can you describe the scenario? Uh, 07 through 010, a great market crash. Yeah. Property but, values. Well, not increase. according to this 11 year thing. Well, that was still. That was, CCI still that, rose. That, that was a problem. That was just a scenario of values rising. It wasn't. But a new owner, it could go up 50, 100, 150%. But another new owner, it would never go down 50, 100, 150% based on sale price. Well, on a cap reset, you're going to go to market, whatever it is, whether that market's higher or lower, um, you're going to reset there and that's going to be your starting point. So yes, it can, somebody that's a long time owner, it could be two times, three times. I've seen it as much as six times, um, the prior owner. So that, that's where your biggest movement is. I'm going to show you an example of what happens in a falling market here in a second. So we, we pretty much already touched on this, the non-homesteads. So that applies to all other properties that don't have a homestead in place. And that was um, in 2018 that the cap, the cap was supposed to sunset. It was only supposed to be in place for 10 years. And the voters approved that to go on into perpetuity. Okay, so... We've got, we've got market value rising. Here's a peak, here's a valley. Here's assessed value. So this has a homestead on it or a 10% cap, either or. This is more reflective of a, of a save our homes cap here. So it's constraining that assessed value increase while the market is going up. The market's starting to fall. This property still has a large differential. So it hasn't caught up to it's true market value yet, even though the market is falling. Once those two meet, they can ride down, then they ride down together. The assessed value can never exceed the just market value. So in this example, it only rises to there, it rides back down. Now that creates a new cap scenario as the market turns. So the market turns back up, you start creating a new differential again. That help explain how it can come down a little bit. A little bit, but I still see the purple really accelerating versus a, a downturn. So that new homeowner who bought at the peak and is just equal to assessed in year three, he takes the ride down too. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, if somebody bought right here and these two numbers were the same, they would literally just start riding right down with that from that point. Okay. And that's the same whether it's new construction or a existing project. Yes, ma'am. And so what will be capped for someone who bought this year is pretty much based on from a year ago. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. You always if we're setting a value on January one, we're using that prior year's sales is really the main driver, particularly for single family or for anything residential. So portability. So what is portability? So Not well, they have to cross 2021. That's going to reset them and then it will protect them going into 2022. Mm -hmm. Portability. So, that difference we talked about between just market and assessed value that is the amount that can be ported from one Florida homestead property to the next. So if you've been a long time homesteader, you've built that differential up, you decide you want to move within Pinellas County or to any of the other 66 counties around the state, you can take that with you. So the way that works is as long as you, um, if you buy a home that that is valued and it's not necessarily what you pay for it, it's how the property appraiser in the respective counties values it. So whatever those two prop, you know, if you sell something in our county for, or I'm sorry, we value it at 400,000 and then you move to Pasco County and you pay and they value it at 300,000, no matter what you paid for it, but then that would be considered a downsize. You're going down in value by a hundred thousand dollars. So we're going to end up prorating that port amount is going to get prorated down. You won't be able to carry the full amount. Here's a cleaner example. So if you're going from 500,000 down to 250 and you had $100,000 of port to take with you, then basically you're going down to 50% of the value. We would take 50% of that port away. So you would be able to carry $50,000 to that next home. If you stay lateral in value or go up, you get to carry the full amount. Up to five hundred thousand. That's the cap. And you, the window you have to do that. Um, we actually we championed legislation that went to the ballot. It was a constitutional amendment, just passed in November of twenty twenty, <laughs> and that was to add an additional year to portability. So, it um, used to be only two tax years, and the problem with that is. People always thought it was two years from when you sold, but it wasn't. And it, it penalizes you for selling later in a year. The only time you got two years is if you sold right at the beginning of the year. As you went through the tax year, if you sold right at the end of December, you were down to basically a year and a day to buy, replace, own, occupy, meet the requirements of owning and occupying by the next January 1. So that was a really tough for a lot of people especially you get in a tight market, they're having trouble buying, they might be in a financial bind, they need a little time to recover, um, or they might've been dealing with new construction and delays. All those things were making people lose that benefit and not being able to carry it forward. So I actually championed the legislation to add an additional year so that property owners would always have a minimum of two years and up to a maximum of three years. So we got that done and that, was, that passed at over 70%. So now, now you've got the, the full three years, potentially. Again, you'd have to sell at the beginning of a, a year in order to get the full three years, but you will always, even in a worst case scenario, have two. So the trim notice, gonna buzz through this. We've actually laid the groundwork for a lot of this. So 
um, the terminology you should have down. So we're just going to show you the quick layout so you know where to look on your trim notice to review things. Um, your parcel ID, your legal description, all that stuff, your taxing district is all there at the top. Your past year's values and your current year's values are depicted here. Here again, you see the three values we talked about, the, the market, the assess, and the taxable for each respective year. Then your taxing authority information, so those are the authorities. You can see the various millage rates for each one broken into three columns. So this was last year. This is if no budget changes are made, which that is, we refer to that as the rollback. So those are the rollback rates. So if they didn't adjust their budgets at all, then in a rising market, if values are rising, then they can roll millage rates back to equate to the same tax dollars. I can't promise that they're gonna do that. They usually don't. Usually millage rates in our county stay flat. Some of them did roll back this year, at least partially. The state, a lot of times, does do full rollbacks on things like Swift Mud um, and the, the state school board sometimes does full rollback as well. So those are good numbers to, to pay attention to. If, and then this is the if the budget change that they are proposing is adopted, is in your final category over here. We also show any non-ad valorums down here at the bottom. That was that flat rate that I was uh, speaking of earlier. Yes, Kevin. Yeah, Mike, I just want to mention in column three, that's the proposed millage rates before their budget hearing. And sometimes when they hold budget hearings, they change those, but they can't go up. They can only go down. Correct. And that happened in a few districts this year when they held their budget hearing, they lowered their millage rates. So you will see a different millage for instance, the county, you will see a different millage on your trim notice than your tax bill because they actually go into it a little bit. Yep. Yeah, the, the county basically went to full rollback this year, except they adjusted and went back up because they, were, they needed some more dollars in the transportation fund for road repairs, and that's funded by the gas tax, and they were going to have to raise the gas tax and they elected not to raise the gas tax, but then didn't do the full rollback as a result. Question. Yes. I'm, gonna try, I'm trying to make this simple. Um, the first year, I mean, okay, it, it, you go back a year in column one, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going for last year. My question is we bought in 2020, right. okay? So we bought in June of 2020, um, so in, in January of 2021, that's when the cap hit. And we went from being assessed at the former value with all their exemptions to the full market value. Correct. Of so that is why, even though the millage rates went down a little bit, we were still passed in every category of full value of home. So that's why our tax bill went from a little over $1,800 to $5,600. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, there. Now, had we had we known about home homestead and applied for that by March first, would it have made a difference on the appraisal time? It wouldn't have affected your market and yeah. because if you bought market equals assessed in the first January one after you bought. You would have had an additional fifty thousand dollar homestead exemption. Had we known that, that would have saved you another eight hundred, roughly eight hundred dollars. Okay. Right. And you should have gotten, obviously, when the trim notice comes out, we have information in there about applying for homestead. And then for every property that sells, we send a sales verification letter along with a homestead flyer to try and get to alert property owners to go ahead and, and make their application. Make sure I'm hearing this right for her. Is it sale price or is it assessed value? Well, so, so sale prices become one of many comparables that we use to help determine market value. Then assessed value, in her case, the cap reset, so assessed value and market value are one and the same when they cross that first January one. 
Then if they have exemptions, the exemptions come off of assessed value to get to taxable value. So at the end of the day, your taxes are calculated based on taxable times millage. Because whatever exemptions the previous homeowners had expired January 1st. Correct. Like I have a question online. Yes. Uh, Marie is asking, how do major home improvements like additions or pools change the taxable value? Okay. Um, well, we pick up permit activity uh, for new construction items. And um, so our big Big triggers for our appraisers to come out and inspect are sales. So sales are a trigger and then permits are a trigger. And, you know, small permits like a water heater replacement, we're not necessarily going out to the house for that. Um, and we don't go inside. So everything is exterior inspections unless a property owner wants us to go inside. So um, what we'll do is we'll go out, we'll look at those new, con new construction items and they will um, get added it depends if they have a um they already have homestead in place and if it's an interior modification you know I, you put new flooring in um, and you remodel the bathroom but you didn't change your fixture counts or you didn't totally gut the inside and remodel everything um, then that's going to generally stay under the cap what we call under the cap so protected by the assessed value so we'll add it to the just market value. So that actually helps reportability. So your overall value goes up, but if you have saver homes in place, you're still, your assessed value is down here and it, it's not gonna move more than the 3% or CPI. So if you make those improvements to a homesteaded property over time within the same four walls, then it's generally not gonna move your taxable value. If you make an addition to your house, that's new square footage, you know, or if you add a pool, you, you add something that wasn't there before outside the four walls, then yes, that's gonna go on what we call over the cap. So if you put in a $50,000 pool, that's gonna go on over the cap. What if you replace your roof? No. <coughs> Paint, roof, just maintenance. That's just maintenance. Yep. John. I have a couple of questions online. Uh, Tracy is asking how she can confirm that the homestead exemption application was approved. You can check on our website, right on the home page. there's a homestead status button that you can click and it will let you know whether it's been approved or whether it's still pending. Um, and then obviously you can you can call as well. but I will let you know that we've and Kevin McKeon has a, a lot of his our thanks goes to him for um, process improvements in our exemptions department. We've turned around where, which in the past could have been six to seven month delays on getting homestead applications approved down to generally we're within about a 48 hour turn for 80% of our applications. Now the other 20%, there's some mi missing information. There's some, some other hair on it that we've got to figure out. Um, we might have some discrepancy that we ran into where it looks like they might have a homestead somewhere else or things like that, and they may not be communicating with us as well as they should. So uh, we encourage everyone to, um, to you know, respond to us. We've had great response. Our team has been reaching out all through, through the last two years with the pandemic via phone and email and gotten great response. And that's really helped us get that turnaround and that, that turn time way down, reduced our phone calls. And um, we're actually going to be building a new online homestead or actually a online exemption application that will address homestead and all other applications that'll be smart. So it'll help you walk you through kind of a decision tree as you provide answers to questions. It's going to be able to suggest exemptions that maybe you didn't even know about or you might be missing. Yes, John. Another question online. Um, uh, this person purchased a home in uh, January 2020, but the trend notice shows the homestead applied for 2021 but not a save our homes cap. The cap doesn't start till the following year. So you're establishing your cap, but then the next year you won't have any differential yet. And the three, the three percent or CPI don't start to protect you until that following year. Cause you have to establish that cap first and then it can't move more. 
than those two figures. We don't have to apply for save our homes, right? That's just in place. That's just part of, of the homestead. And then the homestead, do we have to reply, apply for that every year or is that just in place? One time. Five? Then you'll get a you'll get a postcard from us that will just it's a renewal receipt and you will just if for some reason something changed like you moved out it'll ask you a couple of questions where you can check a box where i i don't live here anymore i moved out of state i i'm renting the property things like that then then we'll we'll address it appropriately your assumptions for um my, my husband in illinois we I'm going to let Kevin answer that because that's. Is this a total permanent now? Yes. Uh, VA total permanent? Yes. There's, there's no need to file it every year. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the status changes. Okay. Very rarely go down. Right. So if, if, if you have total permanent, you, so, you have it forever. Yeah, the, one, the ones that usually require a reapplication or things that are tied to an income level just in case that they break a threshold. And here, um, this section on the trim notice is this is what shows you any benefit you might be receiving from the Save Our Homes cap. You can see in this example, they do have some deferred. And then you can see their first homestead and their second 25. And that's why I wanted to tell you early, it breaks into 225. So that's where you get your 50. You can always check that just to make sure you're, you're getting your appropriate exemptions there. And then this is on the back of the trim notice. These again, all those taxing authorities, their contact numbers, the dates and times of their public hearings. And then that's where your non-ad belongs would be. Explanation of the three columns and some definitions. So all that's there on your trim notice if you want to reference that. Um, tax estimator, this is a tool that we rolled out in 2017. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, John? Uh, we have a question online. Barbara, you can unmute yourself. Uh, yes, my question is I thought I had read something on the back of this sheet or somewhere that assessed value is 86% of market value. Is that is that true or am I mistaken in that? That's part of the tax estimator uh, disclaimer. So the way it works, because we don't know where your property is ultimately gonna be valued. So the best guess at it at that time is basically your sale price times 86%. That's how the, the estimator works to give you a ballpark. So it takes your number times 86% and then it asks you those additional questions, whether you're gonna apply for Homestead. So then it'll add the 50,000, it'll do the, the rest of the math. It'll ask you if you're moving from another Florida Homesteaded property, because then it will also factor in your portability. So. That's the nice thing about that calculator. Okay. If you if you do move, any of you all that just applied for Homestead, if you end up getting a differential and you decide to buy another property, you can just run it through that tax estimator and it will pick up the um, the appropriate calculations for your portability as well. Yes, John. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Another question just to confirm that um, this person bought their house in 2020, applied for Homestead before March 21, but the trim notice doesn't show a save our homes cap for 21. Does that not start until 22? Yes, correct. You have to cross a January one where market equals assess the first January one that you own it. And then from that point forward, every January one where the save our home cap is. So Back on our website, this is our existing website, which we'll be changing here, hopefully before the end of the year. We have a, a, um, a new, new um, greatly improved site that's gonna be rolling out, but right now you can access the tax estimator right there. Um, this is what it looks like. You just answer some simple questions. If you're actually on your parcel already within our system, 
you can just click the tax estimator button and it will already populate your address um, and start to walk you through the process. This is just an example of what the output looks like. It also expands and you can see all the various taxing authorities as well as your non-ad valorums. So the new website, um, we knew that our website got a lot of activity and we knew that the heavy users are not only property owners, but a lot of real estate related profession, um, professionals such as, you know, appraisers, realtors, uh, title and insurance agents, uh, lots of developers and contractors. There's just a myriad of people that use our website as a tool constantly. So we, and it, our existing one has served us well. It's been around for over 20 years. We were one of the first counties to, to go online back in the day and it's, it's done a great job, but it's, it's limited in its architectural design as far as moving forward. It'll never be able to be mobile friendly the way it is. So the new one is mobile friendly, um, a lot more powerful when it comes to GIS layers and sales searches and all those types of things. So we encourage you to, to check that out. Like I said, that'll be um, public facing here before year end. And um, the tax estimator has been a um, big bonus for us. You can see how many runs of that are happening per year far exceeds the number of sale transactions that go on in our county. So we know a lot of realtors and new property owners are getting in there and, and running those estimates. So that's just kind of a sneak peek of how the new site is going to look on the home page. So it'll be nice and clean. You'll be able to execute your searches right here without having to go, you know, you can still drop down and do searches as well. We're also bringing tangible personal property for business equipment onto the site for the first time. You've got lots of speed buttons here to check homestead status or file. Um, we've got lots of stats down here. You'll be able to hit this my location button, which if you're a realtor or even a property owner standing in your home and you're on a mobile device with, with uh, location services enabled, you'll be able to touch that button and it's going to pull your parcel information without having to enter anything. So we're trying to trying to build it out in a really cool fashion, and we we're not using any vendors that have ever built a property appraiser site before. And I did that for a reason because I wanted to have a lot of influence on the design and not get boxed in to the way other people have done things. And we wanted to make this the best in the state, if not the country. So we wanted to make it a uh, very innovative. So watch for that coming out. We're up we're up against our wall here. I'm just going to touch on. On our um, homepage, you can access these quick buyer and seller fact sheets, which kind of in literally in two pages covers a lot of the topics that we were talking about um, the buy for buyers and sellers, just to make them aware of portability and, and um, save our homes, all those types of things. So you can grab those. A lot of realtors are using them now. Title agents are grabbing them, being able to hand them out um, just to direct new buyers appropriately another great service this is i'll promote this for our clerk of the court it's a free monitoring service that monitors your deed activity so you've probably seen those ads where you can pay for a service because you've heard about some of this deed fraud going on somebody that owns their home free and clear been there for a long time all of a sudden somebody does a false deed transfers the property unbeknownst to the real property owner into a different ownership and then goes and pulls out a big mortgage against it and the owner doesn't find out for six months that this has even happened. So all you have to do to sign up for this is go to the clerk's site, look for their, their property fraud alert service, sign up on there. All it needs is your name and your email address, and you will get an email anytime anybody puts anything into Pinellas County records. They record anything with your name. You'll get an email that have a link to the OR booking page so you can review that document. Because if you catch it early on, you'll be able to stop the process. Now, if your name is John Smith, you might get a bunch of emails. But if your name is, you know, like mine, Mike Twitty, you're probably not going to get very many. But I have gotten a few, and they've been appropriate. You know, I had, you know, things of satisfaction of mortgage on something, and it boom, popped through. So you get to see that. You'll see notice of commencements. You'll see all of that, anything that gets recorded related to your name. So I highly recommend that. And I encourage you all to um, join any, any more of our sessions. We do one of these a month, and it rotates. So 
This one, you know, is obviously focused on first time Florida homeowners, but we do another one that's just gets into the weeds on all the various exemptions and that we bring an exemption specialist panel in for that one because they'll answer any questions anybody has in great detail. We also do one for real estate professionals. We did that one last month. So that has people that are title agents and realtors and, and um, appraisers. So anybody within the real estate industry in general, we try to coach them up so that they can make sure they're teaching new buyers as they come into our state or just, you know, a lot of people that have owned property for a long time don't know, you know, but a smidgen of what we address today. Do you ever address like zoning or variances or is that some other department that's that? Yeah. That falls into uh, development review services um, at on the county level. And then if you're at a city, that's they have various zoning departments and planning departments. So yeah, we don't we don't get into zoning and future land use issues. Um, and then we'll as the new website rolls out, we'll start having um, sessions on that to uh, coach people up on how to um, get in the weeds, find the find the powerful tools that are in there if people really use that as a as a daily tool. And we'll, if you have suggestions on other classes that you would like to see that might fall within our spectrum, we're happy to add them. Doing these and um, like I said, keep an eye on our homepage. We'll always advertise them there. You can always register right through the homepage for these. And um, and anybody that needs to make an application today, I encourage you. We'll get you to the front counter and, and we'll get you taken care of. Uh, Is that correct? Yes. But you could start it today if you wanted to, and we could take the rest. We could. We can even do it by phone or email or, but at least the app gets started and is in the system. That's up to you. So, um, so again, thank you for your time and attention today. That's been great. A lot of great questions and we may have some more out there. I don't know if we've got any more virtually, John, any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Make sure you put a cookie in your pocket on the way out <laughs> and, uh, thanks for being with us. Yeah,